Smart businesses use data science for growth. Do you know how? Mind Your Data is a podcast that explores how business owners, entrepreneurs, and managers can understand how to be more data-driven. And once you know how, you can use that data science to increase profits, reduce costs, and boost productivity. And now here's the host of Mind Your Data, Kranti Panam. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mind Your Data Show. The reason I'm very excited, you could tell by, by, with my voice, is about the guest today on the show is Jason Bake. Both of us have similarities in the sense that both of us come from technology background, especially related to data. I am really looking forward to dive into Jason's journey, the lessons he learned, and what we can learn basically around underwriting, because that's what his specialization has been, and how technology background related to data science he's brought into the underwriting aspect of the business. So Jason, welcome to the show. Love to have you uh, tell us a little bit about your background, and then we could go into questions. Uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Kranti. This is uh, yeah, exciting. Um, so a bit about myself. Uh, I have both a very typical and also a unique trajectory. So mm -hmm. I started off life kind of like my, my parents are uh, South Korean immigrants. So uh, I followed a very traditional path of go to a good school, get a good job, just, you know, be happy. <laughs> I was told that that was kind of the, uh, the one path to life. But after doing that for about a decade, I realized it just didn't resonate with me. So uh, I decided to take a chance on myself for the first time in my life. And I quit my corporate day job when I had absolutely no experience in real estate and then decided to become a full-time real estate investor. Um, so it was kind of a, like a, a switch that I flipped. Uh, one day I was taking meetings, I was leading teams, uh, working with clients. And the next day my entire calendar was free and I was uh, trying to figure out how to start investing into real estate. So um, yeah, I, I, I did the very you know traditional thing of climbing the corporate ladder. I started off as a junior analyst uh, climbed to the level of director and vice president. Uh, and I yeah gave that all up because uh, none of it really made me happy. So uh, I'm a full-time real estate investor today with a very specific focus on apartments. I've got about 370 plus apartments uh, that I'm a general partner on. Uh, mm -hmm. I also teach others how to better analyze apartments. And uh, yeah, I'm actually enjoying the, the entrepreneurial life. That's That's great. And part of it is I have very similar background in the sense that you know, grew up in India, came out here, always told, put your head down, work, get a job, I make money, save, be happy, that sort of philosophy. And then at the point that I wanted to start my a business, I got a lot of pushback from my own family. And a lot of people didn't support me in that process. I had to kind of break away from that um, aspect that, you know, it's okay for my family not to like what I'm doing, but I'm going to still do it kind of get away from their shadows a little bit. And it's, it's always a hard thing. You like it or not. And, you know, kudos to you for taking that step. It's very, very difficult when you get trapped into the W2 Coke, if you will, that it's like a yeah, paycheck definitely. that keeps coming and you see there's no paycheck coming and it's really hard. So, you know, how do you feel about that? Uh, in hindsight, that first year of being an entrepreneur was probably the hardest uh, professional, you know, span of my life, because exactly what you said, you, you go from getting a paycheck, you have people put, you know, calendar invites, you have people tell you deadlines, you have people give you a very specific list of things that you just do, and then you do them, and then you're successful. Mm -hmm. uh, but being an entrepreneur is much more like you have to figure out what the best next step is. You don't mm -hmm. really have anyone to bounce ideas off of. I mean, you can, you can build a network. Of, unfortunately, I've done that over the years, but when you're first starting out, you're, you're kind of on your own and you have to figure everything out uh, without certainty. So yeah, definitely one of the hardest transitions of my life. But I even even after going through all of that, I, I don't regret the decision one bit. Just the the freedom to, to wake up every single day and and feel like I can do whatever I want to, uh, mm -hmm. I think is, is something that once you get a taste of, I think it's, it's hard to give that up. <laughs> No, that's true. And and I can resonate so well with the point that you made is you don't have a deadline, you don't have a meeting, you don't have a deliverable from anyone that you're answerable to. Sometimes I feel like I need a CEO for the companies that I have. 
you know, I wish there was someone that's policing me, managing mm-hmm. me, because you know, sometimes you get complacent. And that's most entrepreneurs at at one point when they achieve a lot and, you know, speaking to a lot of them, they will tell you that, hey, you know, I've become more complacent, you know, and that starts to set in a few years into it. And I think at that point, you feel like I wish there was something, something like that. But great point. I, and a lot of people, the first thing they suffer is not making that move to, you know, getting that W2 dopamine hit. And, mm-hmm. you know, the dopamine hit should come from what you said, wake every, wake up every morning and feel free. You know, I think that's, that's mm-hmm. great. Uh, and I wanted to kind of take uh, a moment to jump into a little bit about, talk about where you are at in your journey right now, um, from where you've started. Had you have, have you had a vision for anything that you've started to go down when you when you actually made the switch? Uh, yeah. So when I first started off, I, I was focused on like a one year, a five year and a 10 year vision. Mm-hmm. But I've been going at a pace that kind of uh, exceeds my past past Jason's expectations. So I've actually reduced it to just focus on the 12 month goals. Uh, mm-hmm. When I first started off in real estate, I actually started off in single family homes. I figured I wanted to spend, you know, a year getting just like my first two single family homes uh, and then decided what to do afterwards. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I got I got seven within the first uh, six months. And then after that, I decided to quickly pivot to multifamily. And then Mm -hmm. uh, my next goal was to get my first apartment deal. And I ended up getting four. So it's uh, it's an evolving uh, conversation. Uh, I don't think I set the bar particularly low for myself, but you know, I, I'm doing this every single day. Uh, I'm constantly looking for opportunities, constantly networking. So, uh, yeah, I've been, uh, grinding as, as hard as I can. Uh, my, my That's goal great. is, uh, yeah, to try and continue to grow in apartments. Uh, mm-hmm. but I'm looking for non-residential commercial as well, looking to diversify in real estate. Um, this year I've been uh, doing a big push on personal branding, trying to do, uh, just more content. I teach people, I, I mentioned how to analyze real estate, but I also, you know, put up free content about how to, you know, uh, focus on personal finance and, and grow your net worth. So, um, yeah, uh, not not necessarily a, a hard pivot, but it's all kind of mm-hmm. part of the same ecosystem about uh, investing and, you know, growing your uh, your own personal finances. Yeah, that's good. You know, it shows that you've started to evolve from being a single family to multifamily and now being an educator to, you know, teaching people. Uh, and most of your single family stuff, or did you do them local? to where you lived or uh, did you go out from where you, um, where you traditionally knew the market? Uh, very local. So I live in okay. New Jersey and my single family homes are in Philadelphia, which is probably okay. the, uh, the closest East coast city that prices still are, are reasonable. So uh, yeah, I ended up buying seven single family homes in total in Philly. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, most of the apartments that I have today are spread out across the country. So um, it, it's definitely, you know, when you're first starting off, every real estate investor has the same mindset. Like, I need to be able to drive to the property. I need to be able to touch it. Um, and it is uh, it is a limiting mindset. Uh, I think once I got that taste of, uh, I, I saw all the contractors, I, I got to see the renovations. Uh, once I built up enough of a uh, an expertise, I felt more mm-hmm. comfortable going elsewhere. I knew how to vet contractors. I knew how to vet property managers. So um, yeah, today I'm not really limited geographically, but uh, definitely uh, they, it makes sense. Everyone goes through the same trajectory of like, hey, let me start in my backyard before I consider other areas of the United States. Yeah, I think that's very well said in, in terms of when you look at analysis of your strengths and kind of areas that you know very well, it makes sense to be in your backyard. But, mm-hmm. you know, I've known a lot of real estate investors like what you've said, me including, I've never invested. I live in California and never invested in a multifamily deal in California, I always did deals in Southeast for arguably good reasons. Um, not that San Diego is not a great market. It, it is a great market, but if you know what you're doing, you could do real estate in any market as long as the deal works and yeah, you have to know what you're analyzing very well. So what was, a you know, I would like, love to understand coming from a data science background, what was the mindset when you said, I'm going to do these seven single family apartments? How did you learn how to underwrite? You know, what were the data points that you even looked at? Uh, they're going to be a lot different from what what you see in the corporate world, for sure. But what did you kind of look at when you picked those seven up? What was the, the main, the analysis part that went into it? Yeah, so uh, single family homes, the analysis that 
you need to be done in order to purchase them is a lot simpler than multifamily. So single family homes was actually pretty straightforward. I, you know, I read a lot of books, listened to podcasts, watched uh, YouTube channels, and uh, ultimately decided that it's it's pretty straightforward. You have to have a cash on cash return for mm -hmm. the money that you're investing, right? Uh, money, uh, there's opportunity costs. So if your single family home returns 2% cash on cash, why are you going through the effort of buying a house and doing construction if you could just put it into the market and get 10%? So mm -hmm. uh, I, I did you know, a very simple analysis of uh, based on the rent I'm able to collect minus all the maintenance and the property management and the taxes and, uh, and water and electricity, uh, what is the leftover profit every single month? And uh, as a percentage of my own capital that I put in, uh, what is the return? So uh, right. for single family homes, I typically look for, you know, at least double digit return on my money. Uh, again, mm -hmm. otherwise, it's a lot easier to buy like an index fund and, and get the same exact returns. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's how I started. Uh, I grew very organically. Uh, and even when I was pivoting to multifamily, uh, I did the same exact thing. I kind of just learned on my own. I, I've always said that I have a pretty good grasp of numbers. And I'm fortunate in that translating my skills from corporate America to real estate was actually pretty uh, simple. I used to do econometric modeling for, you know, Fortune 500 companies. So I'd have tons of data sets and data warehouses and data lakes, and I'd be running code. But most of the analysis for real estate is in like a simple Excel. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't want to say simple Excel, but uh, it's it's simple in comparison. So mm -hmm. um, picking up the actual skill set wasn't really necessary. It was more so just understanding the nuances of like how multifamily functions as a business. Uh, but that's just understanding definitions. That's, you know, networking and learning from other people. And then once you have that set, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty straightforward, honestly. Great. I, I think and that should help a lot of listeners who probably want to get in, but are sitting on the sidelines, not understanding, hey, this is too complex. For someone to say it is simple is very actually hardening. What part do you think was simple? I mean, you say simple, it's definitely an Excel spreadsheet is pretty, has a lot of tabs and, you know, a lot of values and all that. But when you say it's simpler than the data sets and, you know, that you've seen, what what was your thought process in what are the specific data elements, if you will, or the different uh, indicators within the spreadsheets that you particularly focus on? Uh, so I, I will say that multifamily is much more sophisticated than single family mm -hmm. homes. Uh, mm -hmm. Most single family homes, you're, you're buying them on your own. Uh, the debt, it's pretty straightforward. You've got like a local bank or, you know, a commercial bank lending you some money uh, and you have very finite expenses. Uh, for multifamily, uh, it does get more difficult in the sense that you have uh, different debt tranches. You have passive investors. You have multiple partners with different equity splits. But still, at the end of the day, uh, an Excel spreadsheet or an, XP, uh, an Excel model is it's finite. Uh, mm -hmm. There's only, it, it's not like it's multiple Excel workbooks that are tied together. It's just all one. So it's all housed in the same thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I was first starting, uh, again, because I, I'm pretty technical, I, I've been working in Excel my entire life. Uh, I essentially went through every single cell. I saw where the formula was and I just followed it throughout the workbook and made notes. I took copious notes. I essentially, it, it's kind of like opening up a car and like playing around with like the motor and like each button to see what happens to the car itself. And then eventually piecing together this broader understanding of how everything works by understanding every single uh, smaller part of it. So that that's kind of how I uh, developed my understanding of how to uh, analyze multifamily by taking mm -hmm. models that I, I got from other people uh, they're they're pretty easy to get. I mean, you can pay a few hundred bucks for uh, models online. You can uh, get models that are filled in by other people, uh, and that's also a great way to deconstruct the assumptions that other people are making and putting that into like kind of like your own data bank, which is uh, what I did. So um, I, I didn't know anything about multifamily when I first started. Again, I, I barely understood how a house held itself together by understanding that you know a experienced multifamily investor sets aside 3% for property management they mm -hmm. set aside uh, $400 a month per unit for repairs and maintenance they typically take the 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 interest rate of whatever a local bank gives them uh, they uh, assume that the economy will get worse uh, in 5 years when they sell uh, taking all of that and piecing it together into a large puzzle took a lot of time 
uh, but it, it helped me truly understand the nuances of how uh, multifamily functions as a business. Right. And and the point that that's so important is it's really understanding the nuances because a lot of people are not comfortable in understanding the nuances, you know, especially that people that all, all the time come and say, hey, how did you do all of these deals? It's because there's a lot of repetitions that we've gone through and especially underwriting is you have to underwrite at least like 100 properties to get to five good ones. If you're not, oh, yeah, if definitely. you're getting five good ones out of 10, there's something wrong with your underwriting if you're just yeah. starting because then your assumptions are off and most people fall off in the underwriting in the assumptions, right? And in the last two years, every model or last three years, I should say every underwriting model looked, everyone looked like a genius because of the market. What's going to be important is how that comes into the next three years when things are not going to be what they were last three years. And how you said in terms of when you think that the cap rates are only going, not going to compress and you know, you're going to sell at a higher cap compared to a lower cap, it changes everything. What have you ever seen that as something that you have to look into um, when you look into underwriting? Yeah, I always make sure that I try to stay up to date on the general market assumptions as best as possible. I mean, I, I'm still mm -hmm. an active multifamily investor, so I still take down deals today. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm part of various networks and I always make sure that uh, I compare notes with other underwriters. I think uh, that's the one aspect of, you know, this underwriting world that I appreciate, like very similar to corporate America. All of us data nerds are very uh, open. Well, we want to share our findings mm -hmm. and our insights because it's not a competition, right? Where we're all trying to uh, make smart investments together, even if I'm not particularly, like if I'm not involved in your investment, doesn't mean I don't want you to succeed. Uh, so yeah, I've got a pretty good network where I'm able to compare notes uh, constantly. And I think a good point that you made is that uh, you have to be, this is just personal preference, but I would never be able to give anyone money without understanding uh, their analysis first myself, because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it might be an immigrant mindset, like my parents instilled into me, but they, they always told me never trust anyone, right? I can, I can only really trust myself. So uh, I, I knew that even when I was first starting, I, I was going to focus on underwriting because I had to understand the nuances. And if you're not uh, data savvy, this might be odd for you to hear, but if you are data savvy, this will make sense. But I always tell everyone I meet that I can literally make every single deal look amazing. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not that difficult to you know change a few numbers around or to uh, pull a few levers in a spreadsheet to make every single deal from a, a crappy three unit in a C class area to a 200 unit A class uh, apartment complex in, in a, an amazing area, all look fantastic. So I always am a big proponent of you have to at least understand enough of the nuances and at least the basics enough yourself so that you know that if you're putting money into a deal, if you're convincing your your uncle and your grandpa to give you money to invest, that you know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, and I don't I don't mean that everyone's malicious and everyone's trying to trick you, but uh, we just have different risk profiles. Like you are in a different state in your life in comparison to me, in comparison to, you know, the next person. So yeah, making sure that you understand at least the the bare minimum, I feel like it is critical to to finding success in, in real estate. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and that goes back to what I just said is if you basically look at a deal and see every syndicated deal basically has the same returns profile. I mean, some of them 18 to 20%, you know, you multiply your money in the next five years, two extra money, pretty much the same IRRs, some of them higher, some of them lower, but it's very, very hard. And when you talk to everyone, they're saying this is the, the most conservative model that, you know, that they, that you could see in the market. And that word conservative is used so loosely because it's relative, right? You know, my, to your great point, you know, risk profile, data mines the word conservative. And you can say that I'm conservative, but you know, you can, your rent bumps could be 5% where my rent bumps, I never assume 5%, but the market last three years has been doing 10%. And I could say, hey, I'm going to assume 5%. But what's the guarantee that it's going to be 5%. So I think that's, that's something that you always have to look into. And I think for what I've learned over the years is absolutely, absolutely look at the underwriting, 
but really look at the person and what he's done historically, even if without history, look at what his, you know, background has been, you know, in terms of corporate success or how he's come into and what his mindset is, rather than just looking at the underwriting alone, which is very, very important. You, you're absolutely right that you always have to trust yourself, don't never trust anyone else, you know, similar, similar belief systems that have, I've grown up with, you know, growing up with a billion people, you're your best friend, no one else is, you know, growing up in India. But I think what's, what's going to be, I'd love to understand when you say at least a few basic nuances, what are those few basic nuances that you basically look in an underwriting? If you only had five minutes to look at an underwriting model, what would be those nuances? I think it's part of some of the things that you started to mention where uh, look at what the rent growth is and the expense growth. Uh, look at how much they're setting aside in terms of total expenses as a percentage of uh, as, as a percentage of income. Uh, I think the most important thing that I look for is making sure that the person who is trying to take down this deal uh, is that the the supply matches the demand because multifamily at the end of the day is a business. Uh, I provide a product, a clean, safe, modern apartment unit, and my customers are, are tenants. Uh, I've seen underwriting from, from groups that they're buying an apartment complex that's an A-class. It was just newly built. They're looking to charge $2,000 a month in rent. They've got a, a saltwater infinity pool. They've got pergolas. They've got dog parks. And then the household income around the area is $50,000. So I think that's a uh, an immediate sign of uh, they're not matching the product to the customer base because it's great if you want to charge two thousand dollars, but if if the the tenants around you can barely afford to make ends meet, there's no way your luxury A class unit is going to stay filled. And then you dig a little bit deeper into the underwriting, right? And then you see that their 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 vacancy is five percent, which is you know market average. But again, the the story doesn't match up. So uh, there there's a lot of key things like that that I, I really like to see. Um, mm -hmm. Another uh, easy kind of flag that I uh, like to not call people out on, but at least you know raise is that if you have um, a lot of people justify that, uh, oh, my rent growth is 5%, but that's okay because my expense growth is also 5%. But that actually doesn't make sense uh, because the rent is double the expenses. So even if you have them grow at the same rate, uh, the NOI gets artificially inflated uh, because it's, it's just a bigger number. If you, if you take a big number multiplied by 5% and a small number multiplied by 5%, it, the difference is going to keep growing bigger and bigger. Yeah. So it's things like that, that I think really show you if someone understands this as a business or they are treating the underwriting as if it's just a spreadsheet and they're just uh, tapping numbers and, and changing things around. Um, right. I also like to make sure that they have a good idea of comps. So uh, if you are planning to do uh, a very, you know, mediocre job of renovating an apartment, which is there's nothing wrong with, that's your business strategy, but your comp that you're using is, again, a luxury A-class unit that's run by a professional, like, hedge fund, uh, and you're saying, oh, they're getting $1.80 per square foot, so we're projecting $1.80 uh, for our uh, square footage, even though they've got a ton of amenities that you don't. Also, a, a pretty uh, easy sign that they're... Mm -hmm squeezing numbers in a direction that I don't necessarily agree with. So uh, yeah, I'd say those are some of like the, the key things that you can quickly take a look at and uh, are, are pretty big red flags. Yeah. And, and you know, great points all across. I think all of them are so important and so easy to hit when you open that up. One other number that I particularly look at is what is your refi cap rate or what is your refi time period or what is your exit cap rate compared to what it is uh, at when you bought the asset. And some of the assets that we buy, we're not buying them at relatively in terms of cap rate. We're buying it for what the value can be. So we right. have a specific business plan in place to kind of go in. Our occupancy numbers are very, very high when we first start. And they kind of get improved over a three-year three, three year period. Uh, they're usually 15%. Sometimes we start at 20%. Uh, economic and physical vacancy because we know that we'll come in and probably renovate a ton of units or basically evict a few people to basically get the units up. So, and you, there's properties next to us where we've seen 
syndicated models where people will come in and say, oh, they, the vacancy is 5%. Yeah, I mean, the, the metro vacancy is 5%, but that particular area, you have a lot of evictions that have not been processed. You know, there's a lot of things that have not happened in that particular county. And if you don't understand, to your point, the local economics and how long it takes if someone's not paying to evict uh, or what the availability criteria is or the history of the uh, the asset, there's no way you'll get make a right decision. So that's something that, you know, I've always looked at in terms of the business models, which they say are conservative because I say, oh, we're in year three, we'll refi. But, you know, you're starting at a 5% vacancy, which is not true because the vacancy currently is actually more than 5%. Mm -hmm. And you just get better and better and better in terms of vacancy, which is not, which you'll never hit. But you're saying, oh, my, my I'm very conservative because the the metro vacancy is about 4% for apartments, which is true. I mean, every metro today, like in San Diego, is probably less than 1% in the city. So it doesn't mean they're all paying, you know? <laughs> I, I love that yeah. uh, that note about the conservative because no one's going to tell you that they're not a conservative underwriter, right? Everyone is conservative. Uh, yeah. It's just a matter of yeah, digging into that definition to, to see if your definition matches theirs. Um, and I think that the refi is a good point where... Um, you know, two years ago, uh, everyone was assuming refi in 18 months, re refi in 24 months, because, I mean, back then, interests were uh, like mm -hmm. three, three and a half percent. Uh, today, I actually, I think it's kind of a red flag when someone thinks that they can refi in three months. I mean, sometimes you have to, like if you take on bridge debt, uh, you, you have to refi. Otherwise, uh, you know, your 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 apartment goes under. Um, but I see some people that even take on, you know, uh, community bank debt. And in order to make the deal work, that refi helps tremendously make IR go through the roof because you pay back a lot of investors and the money that's left is so small that doesn't matter how much cash flow you have, your returns on paper look really big. So right. uh, I think a lot of people that uh, plan for refis to make the deal work is also kind of a, a red flag. Um, I try to make sure that the deal works before a refi. And if a, a refi adds a cherry on top, I think that that's perfectly fine. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's the way to do it is not assume the refi would be possible, but really assume uh, how things can go. And in terms of when you talked about interest rates a little bit and want to touch on that because it's a it's a data item that you know everyone tracks, what's your opinion in terms of the importance of interest rates as a as a, a metric that you look at or you know is there something that you would track over time? Oh yeah, it's a, a, imperative. I mean, the, debt is the f the biggest expense technically for uh, mm -hmm. a property. So even small fluctuations in in what you can get in terms of uh, you know like loan terms uh, can drastically change your your returns. Mm -hmm. I I mean, I would be lying if I said that I I know what the debt landscape is going to look like in the next year because it's just so chaotic today. Right. Uh, but right. I I want to make sure that. You know, when you're talking to an investor, they have some sort of method to the madness. Uh, when I ask people like, yeah, you need a refi, great. But if I ask them, like, how did you come up with this refi rate? Uh, I need people to be. I looked at the Chatham SOFR forward looking curve and I projected, uh, you know, a minimum above that based on how much agency lenders typically charge. And if they don't say that, if they just say, oh, I picked 5.5 because, you know, I just pulled that out of thin air. And that's a that's a big concern, um, right? Yeah, debt is it's so critical. Yet it's so uncertain right now. But at the end of the day, all of real estate is uncertain. You're never guaranteed any returns. Uh, the only thing that you can really do is is mitigate as much risk as possible uh, and staying on top of Fed news. And you know, I, I talk with my my lenders quite frequently just to see other options out there. Like instead of a refi, can we do a um, like a, uh, a supplemental loan on top of that. So making sure you are up to date on the changing debt landscape, make sure that you're mitigating as much risk as possible. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to succeed because interest rates could go to 9% next year. I mean, they, there's always a possibility, uh, but at least I'm, I'm, I'm staying up to date and making the most informed decision. That's great. And going back to a little point about sources of information, are there any particular sources that you track? Because data is only good as the source that it comes from. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
you put garbage in, you, you typically get garbage out. And, you know, you know, coming from the technology world, looking at reports all day and data sets and things like that, I'm sure you understand that better than most people. So what is your, what, what is a trusted source of information that you follow? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, like public sources that I love to stay on top of apartments.com uh, releases a lot of great information. They have got like a chief economist also that uh, I have an economics uh, degree. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the nuances of, you know, supply, demand and the impact on, uh, on like multifamily. So they produce a lot of great card, uh, a lot of great content. Uh, I follow, uh, I think he's a chief economist. Um, I forget where he works, but uh, Jay Parsons is another guy on LinkedIn that mm -hmm. I actively follow. Uh, so I actually, I follow a lot of economists now that I, I think about it because uh, they have a much better understanding of how multifamily plays a role in this bigger landscape. Because it's, it's not just about debt. It's not just about... Um, your apartment, it's not just about your city, it's about how, uh, you know, consumers are spending too much on credit cards and don't have enough income to pay for uh, rent across the board. It, it's about, you know, our relationships with different countries. So uh, it's about supply chain, you know, uh, a few, uh, a few months ago, uh, supply chain really for uh, CapEx costs. So uh, yeah, I follow a lot of uh, economists. Uh, but in terms of like the the nuances of like how much something's going to cost me specifically, uh, I always make sure to go directly to the property managers, the the mm -hmm. people that are held responsible for doing certain things. Uh, if you tell me, you know, you can get a fridge for five hundred bucks, uh, you better get a fridge for five hundred bucks. So and there's like two elements. There's like that macro data that I, I make sure that I follow. Uh, you know, trusted resources that have a history of of uh, you know doing pretty good uh, economic analyses. And then for the mm -hmm. micro data, I go to my local partners. Uh, I talk to my, my local lenders, the banks that I have relationships with, the property managers I have relationships with, uh, so that they can give me the most uh, real-time update on kind of how the, the specific market that I'm in is, is shifting. Yeah. And, and I think great point in terms of looking at data as micro and macro and understanding which needs to come from there. And I'd love to understand, because you said property management, I'd love to understand, obviously, you have apartments and you work with property management. Are there specific metrics or KPIs that you track for your portfolio? And is there something that you look at? I wouldn't say every morning I look at a report uh, just to see how much in income was collected on the property, what's the occupancy, things like that, um, because it's available on our reporting dashboard. Is there anything that you particularly track from the management side once you buy the apartment? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I am an active asset manager. So across all of the, the properties that I own, uh, I'm, I'm making sure that the performance, the financial performance of these properties is, you know, staying relatively good. Today, because of the shift in, you know, all this news of an oncoming recession, uh, leasing is a very important aspect that we uh, pay very, very close attention to. So we make sure that we're tracking how many leads we get, uh, how many of those turn into showings, how many of those turn into applications. Uh, and if we reject them, uh, what is the the core reason why we reject them? Uh, mm -hmm. Same with like mm -hmm. on the other side, if we have tenants you know that are already in an apartment and they decide not to renew, uh, we always try to get feedback from them on why they're deciding to move because we want to make sure that uh, in the next few months our apartments stay as full as possible. So uh, leasing is a definitely a, a big metric that we do stay on top of. Uh, other than that, we we take a look at the the typical the the NOI. What's our delinquency? How much did we collect? Uh, versus how much, uh, you know, our tenants not not collecting. And then uh, also how many evictions that we have to do uh, in, in the upcoming month, because um, what we're trying to find a sweet spot of, uh, we, we buy value at properties, we inject our own human capital into them, but we don't want to be at the top of the market. So we don't want the absolute best tenants, but we definitely don't want the anywhere near the, the worst tenants. So we're trying to play in that like middle sweet spot, just because it's a bit on turn on, how the economy is going to shift. So we make sure that we are hyper-focused on, on, on finding good tenants and then retaining them. So a lot of our, at least our daily tracking is based on, on, on leasing and making sure that we're getting the right people in um, and also taking a look at you know, what types of marketing efforts have led to the, the best uh, you know, ROI. Like if we do an apartments.com ad, uh, 
uh, did that work? If you do a Facebook ad, like what's the quality of tenant that comes from there? Uh, and then uh, even tenant referrals, like how many tenant referrals have we gotten since the last time that we checked? Uh, and seeing uh, how long that tenant that comes from any specific market source, how long they last, because that's really mm -hmm. the only way to, to judge the quality of, of a tenant. Yeah, I think all of those are such so so important to get the right tenant base. And you, you said it right in terms of not getting the top quality or getting the the most bottom quality. You want to re really get a tenant that fits that particular profile. And the way we look at it is obviously we're helping the workforce housing situation, which is a problem. And same thing like you in terms of value add, we always want to put the right tenant in place because we mm -hmm. don't want to deal we, and obviously want to keep them for longer term, which lowers our turnover costs. But more importantly, want to make that a community for people who live and really so that they care. The longer they live, the, the more attention they pay to everything. And I think it's important to really track the different sources that you're getting the leads from. Uh, we use a CRM called Lease Hawk, gives us different analysis of how things kind of are doing on leasing, the number of in, inbounding, the number of outbounding. Um, but that's an area that I think a lot of the operators kind of neglect and I kind of like where you put it. Well, how do you also, is there some analytics in terms of what you do in terms of how your underwriting is compared to actuals and how do you kind of monitor like turnover costs or CapEx and things like that? Uh, yeah, we definitely always make sure that we are, comparing our continuing performance to what we had projected earlier. And if something shifts, we need to figure out a way to pivot our business plan so that uh, we're not too far off from our uh, initial underwriting. And CapEx is actually a very big thing that we do track. It's not uh, obviously like we have like a, a stabilization period that's maybe six to 16 months. Uh, during that phase, when we're doing renovations, uh, we are also hyper-focused on making sure that every renovation that we do has an ROI. But we typically aim for like about 20%. So if we spend, uh, you know, $10,000, uh, we want at least $2,000 of rent bumps for the first year. Otherwise, it's not worth it. So we try to uh, be very tactical with the renovations that we do. Uh, and a lot of that comes from our understanding of the, the local market. Right. If I, if I buy an apartment complex and I've got black appliances, uh, if I switch them all to the stainless steel, it'll cost me three thousand dollars. But if I can only get like twenty five dollars more just because it's new appliances, then that, that's not worth it. So uh, we, we try to make sure that uh, every single element of our renovations during the stabilization uh, makes sense, that it has a tangible impact on uh, the, the rent that we can charge, because uh, other than you know, leasing supply costs are also kind of, they've been fluctuating over the last two years. So we mm -hmm. want to make sure that we are being as frugal as possible. We don't want to over renovate a unit. I feel like that's uh, like the, the death of a lot of apartment complexes. You spend 20 grand renovating a unit and you can charge a hundred bucks more. Like it just doesn't make sense. Right. Um, so yeah, we're, we're hyper-focused on making sure during stabilization also that we are, um, that, that we're keeping track of, of costs. Uh, for, for OPEX, a lot of that is also uh, based on what our property managers can get for us because they're the ones that usually, you know, fix toilets or they reglaze tubs. Uh, but I'm, I'm checking those uh, at least on a weekly basis to make sure that if something looks a little expensive, maybe we try to give them a new vendor. Uh, maybe we ask them if we, we really had to do, you know, whatever it was that had to be done uh, or if they charge us a little bit more for, uh, you know, replacing a water heater. Yeah, can we find a different vendor? Can we shop around? Can we get a few more bids? So it's not that we have direct control over that type of OPEX because, I mean, a lot of it relies on the property manager and we don't want to like become the property manager ourselves. Uh, but we, we're on the property managers like, like a hawk because, you know, we, we have to make sure that our asset is performing well and we're, we're managing the, the manager. Yeah, and I think, you know, great points all across. The way I look at it is, you really can't have a lot of emotion when you have a business plan and the underwriting is the business plan. If you do not stick to it and you go in and put 20 grand into a unit where it's not really giving you that, that kind of rent bump, it makes no sense and you become a bad operator. And pretty much the operators that we've bought properties have always done that. I mean, most of the time they just overdo a property 
where it doesn't fit, that's not needed for that particular tenant profile. And they try to make a C-class value add deal, an A-class looking apartment, but you'll never get the ROI on it. Yeah, exactly. And that's why we always try to make sure that we're trying to give the best possible value to the tenant in the budget that we've allocated. And that becomes the most important metric that we kind of track is this kind of CapEx budget, which is 12, 13,000 or 10,000 per unit for renovation. Is it giving us the rent bumps? Like you said, 20%, 25%, whatever it is. And that's the metric that you absolutely need to uh, look into. The other question is, since you've kind of gotten into this um, from where you started, what have you learned in terms of tweaking your underwriting? Are there any particular lessons our listeners can learn that you've once you've gotten into managing these assets that you've tweaked your underwriting a little bit? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, th there are some elements of asset management that I've uh, now start to funnel back into my underwriting where, uh, for example, most property managers use like a, a 3X or a 4X rule they're trying to vet a tenant, right? So if if you're charging $1,000 a month in rent, your tenant has to make at least $3,000 a month. Uh, I actually use that when I'm underwriting deals now because I know that, again, the, the customer base has to match the product. So if I'm looking to charge uh, $1,000 a month in rent, my average household income around the area should be at least $35,000, $40,000. So uh, mm -hmm. that's actually something that uh, I've you know modified you know uh, like going backwards. I will also say that uh, my ability to suss out things that I think are suspicious has also grown tremendously. So it's not it's not like there's any specific like it's not like I plug in numbers better. It's not like I I do have more accurate assumptions now. Obviously, like mm -hmm. now that I know specifically how much things cost in. Uh, Cincinnati, I can kind of feed that back into my initial underwriting and, you know, be more accurate. Uh, but my ability, like my, my bullshit meter, I guess is what I'll call it, has, has, has grown tremendously being an operator because I see exactly uh, how things are, are spent. And I mean, right. my right. bullshit uh, meter, not only for like, you know, my property manager, which I, I'm, I'm on top of uh, a lot, but also for, for deals that you're analyzing. Uh, if a seller is saying that they're this is an easy example, but they're saying that their property manager is only charging them 2% for their property and and $1,000 per unit in payroll. That, that makes no sense. Like no one in Cincinnati does that. So it's stuff like that, that uh, you can really only develop over your own experience. Uh, you can take someone else's benchmark to like start off mm -hmm. with, but uh, based on your specific market, you're going to have to understand, you know, how much plumbing typically costs. Uh, how much electricity typically goes for every single month per unit and and use that to refine. Um, actually, great. actually, plumbing is actually a good example of like, I, I know typically in Cincinnati, uh, today it's about like 450 per unit per month. And so if I see a deal that from a seller, their plumbing costs are 800 uh, per unit per month, uh, that makes me suspicious. I'm like, there must be a plumbing problem. So then mm -hmm. I can ask the seller for, can you give me your insurance loss runs? To see if they had to, you know, fix like something broke and they had to like file an insurance claim. Uh, and if they don't have that, then I assume there is a plumbing problem. So when I do due diligence, I do a sewer scope. So it's kind of like all, uh, I love underwriting so much because it's, I always say it's like, I'm like a Sherlock Holmes where uh, I know I have like pieces of the puzzle, but I have to make sure I ask enough questions and I know enough so I can put the entire story together. It's kind of my job to make sure that everything makes sense. Uh, and if it doesn't, I have to figure out how to to mitigate that risk, or I have to keep poking and prodding it until it makes sense. So, uh, yeah, definitely a, a huge benefit to being an active operator is I can see how the sausage is made and then use that to to better optimize my underwriting. Yeah, and I think that's what we've learned over the years too. Like you said, is really figuring out what are the nuances in the in their underwriting models that need to be tweaked. You know. Mm -hmm. be it labor costs, for example, insurance that you mentioned has skyrocketed over the years. There's certain metrics that have killed certain deals. Um, in the past, it's been rate caps and things like that, but great points overall. Thank you. Uh, if there's something that you would teach or say to someone you're teaching underwriting um, when they're first starting, what would be that you would like to offer and tell? I mean, what are the typical things that you would tell 
them in their underwriting based on all your experience from the tech world and from the real estate world, you know, is there something that you really use as one liner or a couple lines saying this is what you need to know? Uh, yeah, for underwriting specifically, I always tell people to start from a top down approach. So always start off with the market first before you even waste your time taking a look at the deal. And that comes from a lot of personal experience. Uh, when I first started uh, in multifamily, I would spend 10 hours underwriting this deal and crafting a beautiful spreadsheet with every single nuance incorporated. And then I would Google the address, realize it was, it was in the middle of Trenton, New Jersey, and be like, okay, I'm not, not going to take down a deal in Trenton. So uh, it, there's, like, there's a process that you should follow that, mm -hmm. uh, that makes sure that there's a method to the madness, that you don't waste time. Uh, underwriting as a skill is very powerful, and I, I love underwriting. But even I, I can't look at a spreadsheet for nine hours a day for five days straight. Otherwise, I, I feel like I'm going to go insane. So part of being a, a professional underwriter like or a professional investor is making sure you've got a process to it. The skill is important, but the process is even more imperative because it makes sure that your life is, is efficient, right? I, I don't want to spend nine hours underwriting a deal that I know if I just Google the address, like would, wouldn't make sense. Like I'm not going to take down a, a, a B class ass in a D class area that just no one does that. So I think it's like little tips like that, that I always make sure that you have to uh, make sure that you're following uh, a, a process uh, because even if you're not, you know, even if you are just starting out, and you want to just like underwrite a bunch of deals to get practice like that, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not sustainable long-term. So you have to always right. think about uh, creating these little machines that kind of run on their own. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that, that's a, a big tip that I give to everyone. Um, that's for, great. For, for the, great. Yeah. For those people that also like reach out to me because they like, they're not very data savvy. Um, I always suggest that they just put in the time and effort. It might take them longer to understand the nuances of underwriting. But again, it's just so important, in my opinion, that uh, I know you're not not everyone's a math person, not everyone is a numbers person, not everyone has you know a decade of of spreadsheet work like I do, so it might be harder for you. But at least at least know the basics. At least you know take a few you know courses or like talk to a few people. You can eventually give it to someone else as like a long term underwriter or like a partner who who focuses on it. But uh, I'd say yeah, ne never just blindly trust someone. So. Uh, my suggestion is always to at least know enough to be dangerous. Yeah, that's great. And you just the point around having certain principles when you underwrite and a process around it is so important. That's great. Uh, I think I would love to move into our next uh, piece of our episode where we rapid fire a few questions. Love to understand a little more about your personal stuff. Um, what's your favorite book? Oh, favorite book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Steve Covey. Um, oh, that's I a think great it book. helped. Yeah, it's a, it's a classic, but it, it helped uh, reframe my entire way of thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to butcher it, but you know, his his major point is that you know, focus on circles of influence. Like, if you can't control it, like, why worry about it? And I think I was definitely one of those people that you know, I get frustrated or annoyed or sad that someone uh, you know on another team was wasn't being productive. They weren't like pulling their weight. But uh, once I accepted the fact that I should really just focus on what I can do myself, what I can control. Uh, I think it get rid of a lot of baggage that would typically weigh me down. And I feel like I've been able to, to grow much more efficiently and, and quickly because of it. So yeah, I, I love it. Uh, I still reread it maybe every few years. So highly recommend. Yeah, that's a great book. I think it's great for both, you know, every age group, kids, older, adult, you know, employee, businessman, whatever. Uh, what's your favorite ritual? Uh, I used to do a uh, miracle morning actually, where mm -hmm. I would get up and spend the first hour of my day, uh, you know, working out, meditating, uh, you know, do, uh, writing in my journal, thinking about what I'm grateful for. Uh, I still do like pieces of it today. I've kind of evolved it to, uh, suit my current needs. Uh, most of the time I have like, you know, only 30 minutes or 15 minutes before my meeting starts. Uh, but I love getting up every day and, uh, at least being grateful for everything that I have, I feel like it puts a lot of things into perspective because, you know, some, being an entrepreneur is hard and sometimes life sucks. Sometimes you're not going as fast as you want to. You're not growing as fast as you want to. But uh, if you focus on all the stuff that you have in life that 
uh, are amazing, like your, your spouse or your family or your friends, I think it, it just really helps you get through those tough times. So um, I love spending a little bit of time uh, making sure that I, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm actively grateful for everything that I have. Yeah, I think it gives you a ton of satisfaction. And that's the most important thing in life is being satisfied in whatever phase of life you are. What's your uh, favorite key indicator? Is there something that you look at? You know, for me, it was interest rates for the longest time. Is there something like that? Look at and follow. Yeah, funny enough. So at the end of the day, uh, everyone is an investor for themselves. So my key indicator, just specifically for me, is my own net worth growth that I love to track. Uh, awesome. A lot of people focus on, you know, number of doors or, you know, how much, you know, assets under management that they have. But mm -hmm. I know people that have 100 units that are retired, that they own 100% on themselves. And I know people who have 10,000 units that have three day jobs. So uh, my key metric is, you know, focus on like, I, I love real estate, but I'm in real estate for a goal for a personal and financial freedom. So I make sure that I'm focused on the, uh, the, the KPI that makes the most sense to me, which is my net worth, because after that, I can you know, after a certain point, I can retire or, or, you know, spend more time with family. So that that's my key indicator. Yeah, yeah I think that goes with well with the seven habits, which, which has beginning with end in mind. So you always have your end goal in mind. That's great. What inspires you on a daily basis? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I spent my entire childhood getting compared to other people. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I was very competitive. And I always just wanted to win. I wanted to beat the next person. I wanted to prove that I was smarter and better and whatever. But it's only uh, in the last maybe five years or so where I've decided to move away from that. Uh, and instead, uh, I'm inspired by just getting better every single day. I think I, I realized that comparing myself to other people actually didn't really make me happy at all. Like it just made me more anxious or more angry or more frustrated. So uh, I wake up every single day uh, looking forward to the day ahead and making sure that I can just do a little bit of something uh, that is better than the day before, whether that's helping one new person, whether that's analyzing one new deal, whether that's, you know, getting one new subscriber on YouTube or something like that. Um, so I tried to uh, remove myself from worrying about other people and just focusing on on, on me and, and making myself better in comparison to, to, I guess, yesterday's Jason. Yeah. And I think you know, growing in an Asian household, I had the same thing, you know, always compared to someone and you're always, you always have that person that you hate because, you know, not that because of the, because it's not because a guy was bad or the gal was bad. It was because you were always consistently compared to what they were getting to or what they were oh, kind of yeah. hitting up. So, you know, totally can totally empathize and sympathize with that piece. Um, What's your favorite online tool? Uh, favorite online tool um, for real estate, there's something called like the FFIEC GeoMap, mm -hmm. where uh, I love using it because it's uh, it allows you to plug in an address and it shows you the tract of land that that property is on and the household income of that and the neighboring uh, tracts of land. Uh, it's just much more uh, accurate than a lot of brokers will give you like a five mile and a 10 mile and like a hundred mile radius but I want to see specifically where my property is and like the, you know, a one mile radius. So uh, yeah, if you Google FFIEC, uh, it's like an acronym for something, GeoMap, uh, it's, it's a great tool for, for real estate. Uh, that's a really good tip. Thanks a lot. We'll, uh, we'll definitely include that as part of our show notes, Hope you know, and for everyone to kind of take a look at it. But yeah, those were pretty much our questions. And, you know, Jason, thanks a lot for taking the time, man. I, Really appreciate you, um, take, you know, coming out and talking about all of the stuff, especially on things that a lot of these things that we've spoken about are actionable things that people can take and really plug in into their real estate journey, specifically to multifamily. And uh, would love if someone leaves feedback for Jason and would uh, appreciate any kind of inputs uh, on the conversation. But Jason, thanks again. I really appreciate all your you taking the time and effort to talk through all of these points. Of course. Uh, yeah, love talking data. So thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.